Hi, um, I'm uh, Dr. Antonino Secchi, uh, an orthodontist, uh, practicing orthodontist from Philadelphia. And um, I'm a clinical assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And I've been uh, teaching uh, treatment mechanics for almost uh, eight years at the University of uh, Pennsylvania. I would like to thank Densply GAC for inviting me to participate in this webinar to talk about something that is really my passion and is uh, treatment mechanics. I would like to introduce you uh, in this um, roughly 60 minutes uh, on the CCO system and I would like to basically start reviewing treatment mechanics. Uh, I would like to mention something very important and is that um, basically uh, we're going to be talking about mechanics but I want you to remember that basically every case that you will see in these presentations there is a diagnosis a treatment plan, a mechanics, and a patient management. So um, it's important to remember that even though I will basically emphasize uh, treatment mechanics. As you can see here, uh, I have um, a pointer. So uh, when I want to emphasize anything, I'm just going to be moving this uh, green, green pointer. So um, CCO or Complete Clinical Orthodontics is a system that basically integrates uh, three different uh, technologies that we have and we have had for a, for a long time. Uh, the first one is the straight wire appliance that as we all know is been with us for uh, more than uh, 40 years, 42 years to be very uh, uh, pre precise. Also self ligating brackets that um, even though uh, the first system was developed in the 30th it wasn't until pretty much um, uh, 15 years ago that they started becoming more popular and specifically about uh, 2000. And also integrate the um, heat activated arch wires and the stainless steel arch wires. Interestingly, the stainless steel uh, is being with us for uh, the beginning of our profession, but the heat activated arch wires, they became more popular in the 90s. So how we integrate these three technologies that we um, have for a long time is going to be basically uh, the core of, uh, of this uh, system that we will introduce in this presentation. Uh, very important uh, is the levers. As orthodontists, as clinical orthodontics, uh, we want quality and we want quality with, uh, with consistency. And I would like to start emphasizing that concept, the concept of consistency in the result. So uh, it's very important for me to emphasize that consistency means that regardless of where you start, the end will be the same. And um, that means that basically we would like to bring every case that we treat uh, to a very similar and consistent end. And I would like to start showing you uh, some few cases that I have treated over the years. Um, I would like to show you the initial arch wire and the final arch wire and the treatment result. Well, we will see some f uh, more cases uh, during the presentation, but I would like to start showing you these few uh, different malocclusions and how we um, treat it uh, to emphasize consistency. So case number one is basically a class one uh, cra uh, crowding. And you can see that's the first wire uh, when we start treatment. This is the last wire just before we remove the appliances. And a very important concept is this concept of uh, finishing the case with the appliances in place. So you can see here basically is the case after uh, removing the braces. You can see that over here too in this view. And um, uh, the next case, case number two, is basically an extraction case where I remove upper first bicuspid and uh, lower second bicuspid, uh, minimum anchorage in the lower, uh, medium to maximum in the upper. You can see the first wire the day we place the braces. And that is uh, the last wire with some fine tuning. And basically this is uh, the case finish. That's another view over here, the frontal view. You can see also the um, 45 degree view with the arch coordination. So you can see also in this case over here, it's a non-extraction uh, class 2 on the, le on the right side, uh, deep bite, and that's the first wires. Uh, we upright the molars, we distalize the molars to achieve class 1, we level the occlusal plane. 
that's the first wire and this is the um, last um, arch wire where uh, the occlusal plane is uh, is level arch are coordinated um, basically the molars have been distalized on the on the right side to achieve a uh, class one that's the final case after we remove the appliances or you can see also a case like this is a full class two um, that we treated I treated with um, an expander uh, some uh, class class 2 orthopedic treatment and you can see this is the uh, initial photograph that's the final arch wire and you can see over here the final result so you can see uh, the consistency uh, the next case is basically just the opposite it's most like a class 3 malocclusion where you can see the first uh, wire, uh, we treat this case with some in interproximal reduction and um, class 3 mechanics, uh, specifically on the on the left side. So that's the first wire. This is the last wire before removing the appliances. And you can see right over here is the final result, achieving the same goals as all the other cases. Or you can see uh, this uh, case number six, the last one, just a few examples. This is an open bite where we have to leave a space uh, in the left side uh, for the implant. And basically, this is the first wire. And this is uh, just before the appliances were removed. And you can see the next photograph is the case finished with the implant um, in place and the crown. So the, the idea of these few cases is just to emphasize the concept of consistency and the concept of regardless how the malocclusion looks at the beginning, the pattern, the occlusal pattern has to be the same. And that's a goal that basically we uh, have to achieve during treatment. And uh, basically we will explain some of the few strategies that we use to achieve that. Um, although this presentation is just the introduction of uh, the um, of the mechanics that, that, that we use. It's very important to understand, uh, interesting I would say, and uh, the clinical, um, the evolution of the clinical orthodontics. If we, if we understand this, um, we will see um, how we have changed over the years. If you can see here, we start with angle in 1900 and pretty much every 15 to 20 years, there is a new movement in clinical orthodontics. Uh, Tweed in the 40s, uh, Beg in the 60s, Ricketts in the 70s, uh, Roth in the 80s, uh, Andrews, Alexander, Janelli, Settling uh, between the 70s uh, and the 80s, McLaughlin, MBT in the 90s, and Damon in 2000. But it's been already uh, almost 15 years, and I think that we're ready for a new movement a movement that have to integrate basically uh, most of the good concepts that we have learned over the years uh, with the new technologies, with the technologies that we have today that we understand much better right now to develop a system that can be applied and um, where we can achieve uh, consistent uh, quality results in a very efficient and practical uh, uh, fashion. Interesting, every one of these movements is being is being linked to different appliances. As you can see over here, from uh, 1900, a blank bracket, a single bracket without any information on it, we went to the twin bracket developed by uh, one of the uh, faculties at the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Barney Swain, in 1954. Then you have the Beck bracket, the Lewis bracket, uh, popularized by Alexander, then the straight wire in 1970, and today in 2012 we have a, um, a lot of uh, um, self-ligating brackets, as uh, you can see over here, and I think that um, there's no question that they came to stay, and uh, right now um, the, uh, the number of people using self-ligation have grown a lot, and therefore we need to understand these different appliances, how they work. Also it's interesting to see the trend in the wires. It's amazing that over 75% of the history of orthodontics is being done with only one wire, stainless steel. But lately, in the last 20, 25 years, we have a lot of more arch wires, uh, like the super elastic and uh, heat activated uh, arch wires, that they have changed the way that we practice. And we need to understand how we can integrate those 
with the appliances that we have today to um, take advantage of the technology and achieve the results and that we all like. I have to give a little bit of an introduction of the history of the straight wire so we understand uh, what we have now, why we modify some of the things that we're using and I think it's important to emphasize that the straight wire was developed in 1970 by Larry Andrews was the first tooth specific uh, appliance that has tip torque and offset for each individual uh, tooth and that was basically when uh, the prescriptions um, started becoming popular um, he, uh, he developed this uh, standard prescription where every tooth as you can see in the table has a specific torque uh, values, tip values and offset uh, interestingly, after about six years of practicing with the straight wire, Larry Andrews um, changed some of the uh, bracket uh, values because of uh, problems that he had with uh, extraction cases. As you can see over here, he overcorrect about 12 different brackets uh, to uh, overcome problem um, of closing spaces when he slide, slide teeth, sliding teeth using round wires, specifically 016 or 018 stainless steel. As you all know when we close spaces on a round wire there's some secondary effects movement that we have. Uh, as an example, uh, over here I place the canine where um, four different uh, degrees of tip 11 degrees was the standard and he overcorrect the canine to 13 degrees, 14 degrees and even 15 degrees so in cases of uh, maximum anchorage, maximum retraction of the canine in round wires the canine would uh, basically tip distal and rotate so he overcorrect the bracket for that reason and he came out with the uh, Andrews translation bracket which uh, basically um, were asking for having a large number of uh, different brackets and a huge inventory and basically um, it didn't go well commercially and it wasn't until the 80s when uh, Dr. Roth, uh, Ron Roth um, basically took one of the Andrews um, set setups um, and basically uh, he uh, modified some of the values and he came out with the um, a rough prescription and you can see over here that he increased the torque of the upper incisors increased the tip of the upper canines increased the torque and offset of the upper molars reduced the tip of upper and lower premolars and molars and it was very, um, uh, he was very uh, big on filling the slot so one of the uh, rough um, bigger thing was to fill the slot to express all the values uh, using a 21 by 25 stainless steel arch wires and because of the over corrections that he picked basically many people describe uh, this prescription as you can see over here as an extraction um, prescription interesting interesting um, was the um, upwriting of the molars and premolars that they built up in the prescription because as you can see over here the tip they reduce they reduce the tip of the upper molars and they reduce the initial tip of the lower molars and second premolars and the idea was to upright these teeth as you level and align as you can see here most of the malocclusions they start with a um, mesial, mesial uh, angulation or tip of the crowns and as you level and align those tip upright so uh, that was what many people call at that time uh, build anchorage on it and this concept uh, was taken from uh, Charlie Tweet that in 1940 as you all know uh, he came out with the uh, anchorage preparation basically um, through second order bands uh, he was uh, upriding the molars to create anchorage before start moving the anterior teeth so um, then in the 90s um, we have uh, MBT, uh, McLaughlin, Bennett and Trevisi uh, modified the Roth prescription based on the appliances and the wires that they were using at that time 
as you can see over here they were using conventional twin bracket lighter forces and um, they realized that most of the orthodontists uh, will not fill the slot and they will use uh, the um, 19 by 25 stainless steel as the biggest arch wire and as you know on an 022 slot a 19 by 25 stainless steel has about 12 degree of play and therefore they removed some overcorrections and they uh, add other overcorrections um, based on this uh, play for instance over here I just highlight the uh, 17 degree of torque for the uh, central incisors um, and the 10 degree of torque for the lateral incisor etc so it was based basically on the play uh, that the 19 by 25 stainless steel has on a 022 slot but right now um, uh, after almost uh, two decades of, uh, of, uh, of the MBT we're in the in the 21st century and uh, self ligation became or is becoming popular and um, uh, I uh, as you all know we have active appliances passive appliances I don't want to uh, argue um, uh, about that passive or active in this uh, webinar I just would like to uh, say that that I uh, that I prefer and I use uh, active appliances and therefore uh, all the cases that you will see and, uh, and all the mechanics that I will explain is based basically on active uh, self ligation uh, brackets over here uh, I place uh, a photograph that we took at the University of Pennsylvania of, uh, of an innovation bracket when you can see basically uh, on, on the right uh, the design of the slot and on the left uh, you can see a photograph that I took of one of my patients uh, with a 20 by 20 bioforce inside of the bracket and uh, it's interesting to mention this uh, design of the slot and you can see here the, the wall uh, the base of the slot is 022 and uh, this is the occlusal wall that is basically 028 and the smallest wall on this uh, bracket is the gingival wall that you will see in the next photograph right here that is basically an 019 you have here a little space where this active clip or I would say a clip with memory that if you push the clip out the clip will try to come back and it will be pushing the wire into the slot that can be a wire that is bigger than 019 or can be a round wire that is smaller but if the tooth is rotated the wire will be acting on the clip and as the clip goes out the clip will try to come back and push the wire in so that is how the clip become uh, become active and it's important to understand how the uh, this bracket and wires uh, work in order to appreciate some of the changes uh, that we have done in the values here I have a photograph explaining basically uh, how the active clip works and why uh, it's been shown that provides a, uh, a very good uh, torque expression uh, to express torque you basically need to seat the wire in two walls and you can have a wire that is not uh, filling the slot however is if the if the clip as you can see here is pushing the corner of the wire and is uh, pushing the wire against this tool the wire doesn't have to necessarily fill the slot to be expressing torque so it's uh, almost like a, the clip uh, act as the other as the other wall that keeps the wire seated over over here and it's been shown that basically uh, active appliances provide um, a very good torque in wires that they're less um, um, uh, in size that basically the O2 choose a lot I would like to show you this uh, study done by Dr. Nobriga and colleagues that basically they, they are um, they are evaluating the, the torque efficiency uh, of two different appliances an active and a passive um, 
uh, self ligand on, bra on brackets all O2 choose lot and I will show you specifically the lower second bicuspid they tested uh, different arch wires on this apparatus that you can see over here on the right you can see here the brackets is an O2 uh, slot uh, with 22 degree of lingual torque is the second uh, lower bicuspid and they tested in different arch wires like the 17 by 25 18 by 25 19 by 25 and 21 by 25 it's very interesting to notice that uh, as you can see over here on the innovation bracket on a 19 by 25 stainless steel you have full expression of torque so basically you don't have play between the wire and the slot be because of the clip the active clip this is very interesting because if you use a bracket with over correction because of the play then that over correction will be expressed fully on a 19 by 25 and therefore some adjustment has to be done in order to uh, express the values that, that we really want so it's very interesting and, uh, and therefore, over, uh, over the years, uh, we realized that there were some problems with the current versions of the straight wire uh, and self ligating brackets available. Uh, interesting is to see that there are countless straight wire prescriptions available in the market. And the reason is, I mean, the question is why? Why do we have so many different setups? Also interesting is to notice that none of the straight wire uh, setup prescriptions was really made to fit an active self-ligation bracket. Um, that's very important because I just mentioned that the way that the arch wire interact with the, with the bracket and, uh, is different. Since you have a clip, um, basically the whole story changes and basically we need to understand how that clip interact with the arch wires to basically um, design or uh, the proper mechanics and also the proper values of the bracket. Also another thing that is very important is that we realize right now that the molar tubes are passive. Interestingly, uh, self-ligation brought these two words uh, to the table passive and active passive and active we were not talking about passive and active in 1990 uh, we didn't even know what that with what that meant at that time so these two words passive and active are pretty new uh, for us and basically it is important to realize that tubes have been always been passive there's nothing nothing really pushing the wire again this this slot on a on a uh, on a tube and that is very important because we have realized uh, now that there is a significant amount of plate even in large arch wires um, in the molar tubes and we know that that basically um, means that we have a lot of uh, uh, I mean lack of control specifically with torque specifically torque is very difficult to um, express in in tubes as you can see in this slide over here uh, with the tubes, we can control tip, torque, and basically rotations of the uh, molars. And um, it's, it's very interesting uh, because, as you can see in this photograph right here, uh, another photograph that we took at the University um, of Pennsylvania, uh, you can see uh, how much space you have in the slot when a 19 by 25 or even a 21 by 25 stainless steel arch wire is in the is in the tubes. So there is a lot of play, and that play basically uh, is against uh, torque expression. And you can see also in the next photograph, interestingly, uh, we measure different tubes from different manufacturers and just to give you an example of how much variability on the sizes you can find you can see here on the on the on the left uh, a tube that they're all O2 and you can see this one is um, this one is uh, the one on the left is O24 by O32 the middle one is O22 by O28 that's about right the other one is O23 O31 so it's basically there's a lot of variation 
between the sizes of the tubes and, uh, and that variability and the play that you have inside of course um, change the expression that you get I challenge um, everybody every clinician to go back to you uh, to their clinic and to um, grab a big wire the biggest one that you can find in your office a 21 by 25 and just put it inside uh, a tube in your hands and you will be surprised how um, how that tube will slide over that wire uh, I mean um, as, as butter uh, it's, it's really unbelievable so um, you can see that that lack of control specifically specifically um, uh, is a, is a, is seen in in the second molars. The second molars is a terminal tooth. It's the last tooth of the arch, and basically is the is the hardest to uh, to control. And typically, as you see in this two photograph over here, the lower molars will roll lingually, and the upper molars they stay labially. Very difficult to torque them. Um, uh, to torque them palatally um, and you can see in many in many situations um, after we level you see the the lower uh, second molars they roll in you see a different in the marginal ridge you think this the high of the cusp or the high of the bracket and it's not the high it's just the lack of torque expression the same thing in the upper uh, molars and usually that palatal cusp is always hanging down and it's very difficult to level the curve of Wilson uh, and therefore uh, we need to express uh, more torque on those uh, on those tubes as you can see over here uh, they have changed the prescriptions over the years uh, just to account for that from uh, um, Andrews minus nine degrees of uh, palatal torque for the molars Roth overcorrect that to minus 14 to trying to level the curve of Wilson for functional re reasons and it wasn't enough and uh, we modified that uh, with the CCO prescription and we have a molar tube of minus 14 and one with minus 20 specifically for the second molars as well as the lowers we upright the, the molar tubes to minus 25 and minus 20 uh, degree of uh, lingual torque for the second molars. Um, by default, we all we all we always um, place the molar tubes in the lower, more gingivally than we should, just to avoid contact um, with the upper teeth. And the more gingivally we place the tube, the more um, lingual torque we are expressing, specifically when the labial surface of the molars is very convex so um, uh, this is why um, an, uh, an overcorrection was really needed you can see over here this uh, this is one of my, my cases where I use it for teaching the value of, of torque um, expression in the molars you can see this um, this uh, open by here beside that this is an adult uh, with small lateral incisors um, you can see a little bit of uh, class 3 -ish developing, some crowding in the lower, uh, congenitally missing second premolars in the lower arch, and an open bite. And if you see that open bite is due to a primary contact all the way in the back of the left side because the palatal cusp of the upper second molar is basically touching the labial cusp of the lower second molar this is what is called a B B contact and that B contact can be corrected many times just by torquing the upper molars in and the lower molar out in order to seat the uh, palatal cusp on of the upper molar on the fossa of the lower molar and therefore close the bite as you all know one millimeter of difference of the vertical in the back means sometimes two or three millimeters in the front and I will show you just how I corrected this case by leveling and aligning and providing the right amount of torque uh, on the molars so here's the case the day I um, I placed the braces uh, bends in the second molars and um, you can see um, these um, this zoom of the of the photograph what I like to highlight 
um, the the contact of the second molars, um, the upper with the lower. So um, we will we will not review wire by wire as we usually do in the courses. We will just go from this wire, the first one, to the last wire over here. And uh, when you can see that the bay is closed, the closed plane is level, and we have um, a better overbite over jet and a, and a better uh, intercast patient. So um, the idea, um, uh, as you can see here with the finished case, uh, you can see how the device closed. You can see here after one year uh, post a treatment. And basically what I would like to emphasize over here is basically that we went from the upper photograph to the lower photograph uh, to the to the open by to the by that is closed was all due to management of the molars and in the next photograph you will see how um, the molars look level you don't see the palatal cusp of the upper second molars hanging down the molars are um, the curve of Wilson is more level as well as the lower molars where you can see that the cusp the um, the labial um, cusp of the molars are in one line and that was achieved through management of the torque so the torque of the molars that we can express with our appliance is very important and it helps also to coordinate the arches and achieve uh, sometimes corrections in the vertical plane and if you can see over here uh, the proper inclination of maxillary and mandibular molars due, due to uh, basically a proper torque management another thing that I would like to bring um, is the, the offset um, other prescriptions um, years years be before over corrected the distal offset of the molars as you can see over here in this photograph the lower molars the lower molars have zero degree offset and the uppers they have 10 degree offset the distal offset that was basically be because the um, mesial buccal cusp of the um, first and second maxillary molars is more prominent than the distal buccal cusp because it's more prominent the tube has to be wider on the distal pore than on the mesial pore uh, how much wider about 10 degrees so you don't have to basically uh, put a a, um, a first order band to um, on a wire so then uh, some some uh, other orthodontists over the years they overcorrect this distal uh, rotation in order to achieve more anchorage but that anchorage uh, right now we don't need it and we will see uh, in just a few more slides why we don't need that anchorage built into the uh, offset of the molars and basically um, the offset can actually um, give you some problems um, for arch coordination and we will see now so therefore we don't like this uh, overcorrection of the offset and we left our prescription with zero degree of offset for the lowers and 10 degree of distal offset for the uppers and you can see here typical situations that many orthodontists see um, uh, in a routine basis is how as you start leveling and aligning as you can see in the left photograph um, you can see that the molars in the lowers they just rotated um, distally and then I have to remove the band put the tube more distal in order to rotate the molar mesially and be able to basically align uh, the groove uh, and the molars in a correct relationship so you see that a lot in the lower molars as well as the upper molars and that can cause uh, a lot of problems for arch coordination So you can see over here in this uh, diagram that I tried to explain basically um, how um, arch coordination can be affected by rotating the molars distally now you can do that by placing the tubes in the wrong spot to missile by using too much over correction uh, on the molar tubes or by using auxiliaries uh, 
la, such as uh, transpalatal bores, if they're not very well adjusted, they can uh, rotate the molars distal. If you rotate the molars distal like this, you will realize that the wires come out mesial um, to the buccal port and distal to the lingual port. That will eventually moves the premolars out and the second molars in like this and they will produce a problem with arch coordination. Many times after we level and align we start seeing that we uh, have an end on molar relationship on the second molar and we don't know uh, um, what's happening or you see that you lost the coupling or it's difficult to couple the premolars and sometimes it's just that the molars are so heavily distal rotated that they're bringing the premolars out and of course the premolars will not move bodily because the roots they usually tend to be in the bone but the crown is the one that's going to sort of tip buccally and it will look in the arch in the mouth it will look like uh, um, the premolars are not coupling and they lost the relationship so very important is to um, have the right offset for the molars this case over here I used to um, to see how a simple case like this one that it was a class one with crowding can uh, can become a problem uh, if we if we if we uh, um, basically don't manage the offset of the molars. You can see this is um, starting the case with a no one four centaloy, and suddenly as I start leveling and aligning, the case start opening until basically the bite gets um, open. Um, I'm just gonna go one slide back so you can appreciate um, a little bit more this you can see that now the bite is open and it's touching only on the molars so uh, that was a problem that I created it by by rotating the molars distal too much with this transpalatal burst I was trying to torque the molars in and I, I did adjust the bars um, with too much distal rotation and you can see how the molars the first and second molar in the next photograph uh, you can see that the first molar is really distal rotated. You can see this huge step that I um, that I highlight here uh, with these red lines. You see that a lot in the upper and the second molars, and that is a problem with an ex excess of uh, offset. That offset will make basically the molars to be touching, specifically the first molar on this oblique ridge of enamel that you see in blue over over here and then this primary contact will keep the bite open and basically uh, it will produce a vertical problem so as you can see over here what I had to do in this case is to change the the bands to take them out and to place them in the right in the right place more distal and also I removed the transpalatal board to uh, basically um, re-coordinate the arches and just by doing this the bite the bite closes as you can see over here the mandible auto rotate the bite close and basically um, we uh, I finished the case that's the last arch wire and this is the uh, they have removed the braces with a good intercaspation you can see here the frontal view so it's, um, another thing that is very important to mention is the um, inclination or torque of the incisors. Many of the mechanics that we use, specifically here in the United States, are class 2 mechanics, either uh, class 2 elastics uh, or class 2 correctors, forces, herbs, etc. Even leveling the curve of speed in many cases produce a proclination of the lower incisors and they tend to upright the upper incisors. So therefore to have very good torque control of the incisors is very important. And um, we have changed over the years uh, from the Andrews prescription, the standard, uh, uh, to the Roth where he increased the torque of the upper teeth because it's very difficult to achieve proper torque in some of the appliances that they were using at that time they needed to fill the slot and losing torque was uh, common specifically in extraction cases then as we mentioned 
MBT increase the torque of the upper and increase the uh, lingual torque of the lower incisors uh, due to um, play in the arch wires uh, 19 by 25 stainless steel and the brackets and um, we have used them all in self ligation and uh, just as a summary I can tell you that after we tested uh, clinically um, we, uh, we were happy with the results that we achieved with the uh, 12 degree uh, in the upper and uh, minus 6 in the lower uh, remember that uh, torque specifically in the upper is expressed fully expressed on a 19 by by 25 stainless steel also um, we uh, modify uh, the canine in the upper um, as you can see here in the for in the in the diagrams we um, we uh, left the upper canine with 10 degree of missile of missile tip um, we went away from the 13 degrees that is being proved uh, time after time that it, uh, it moved the, the root of the canines to distal, almost touching to the premolars. Another thing that we did was uh, up, we upright the uh, lower canines from minus 11 degree of uh, torque to minus 8. And the reason was because um, today as you can see in this photograph, specifically when you have nice arches, um, upper and lower arches have been uh, have been um, basically uh, coordinated. Um, phase one, a lot of uh, um, expansions are, are being done, and when you have a good upper arch that really match the lower arch, sometimes in the transverse, sometimes it's very difficult to couple. As you can see on the left and you would really would like to upright more the canine or actually uh, the lower or move the upper canine in a little bit and you would like to have a relationship more like the one that you see in the right side of the screen so improve the canine over by over jet so we have our prescription of uh, minus 7 for the upper and minus 8 for the lowers there are some options also uh, for different cases um, as you can see over here, uh, this is basically uh, the prescription that is available and there's some few teals that they have an option like the lower incisors torque minus 6 or uh, minus 1 or the upper canine minus 7 or 0 degree is another option too for some very particular cases. Um, as you can see over here, this is the the, the full uh, setup uh, with every bracket uh, as as it is, with the tubes and another thing that this photograph um, brings uh, of this setup is bracket bracket placement. As you can see over here, the goal is to be able to line up every single tube and bracket with an arch wire. Um, and the idea is basically to have all of those brackets uh, in the in the right in the right place. And I would like to mention really bri briefly about bracket placement. You can see here that these dots uh, they represent the FA point, which is the middle of the clinical crown. And the idea is that when the teeth are all perfectly aligned um, in the arch, you have all these dots basically all tied together with a line that it could be basically a wire and the, um, the challenge for the orthodontist is basically to be able to place the bracket on top of this FA point and so when we are all level and aligned the case looks almost finished before replacing the appliances as you can see in this particular case over here what I would like to emphasize that with uh, is a straight wire that goes through all the FA points where the brackets are placed and basically the case is finished with all the crowns in the ideal position before we remove the appliances as you can see in the next in the next photograph another very important topics that I would like to cover at least give the introduction to it is the stages of treatment mechanics this is really really the core of the mechanics in order to have a very uh, efficient 
and a uh, practical uh, way to um, to basically achieve the result. Um, I I like to divide the stages in three, as many as many uh, clinicians do. Um, stage one, leveling and aligning. Stage two, the working stage, and stage three, the finishing stage. What is really important to emphasize uh, at this point is that every single stage has goals that you need to achieve before going to the next stage. And, um, those goals need to be really clear and the movement that will happen in one stage are different than the one that, we, um, that, that, that will happen in the next stage. And also it's very important to notice that there are some specific arch wires at each stage that um, you should be used to facilitate to achieve those goals. Even though um, we could be talking a, a long time uh, at each one of the stages, I would like just to um, briefly emphasize or highlight just a couple of concepts uh, for each one of these uh, stages. So uh, we will start with stage uh, one, leveling and aligning. Stage one, leveling and aligning. So uh, as I mentioned, I'm just going to point out a couple of things of each one of these uh, stages. So um, it's very um, interesting to see how uh, on a case that need alignment at the very beginning, there are some um, different forces acting uh, over the teeth. Um, and some people have called this reciprocal anchorage. So in this diagram here, uh, you have uh, the wire engaged in every single tooth. Uh, the wire has memory. The wire is going to try to uh, start recovering the arch form and you can see that there are some forces that they will be acting over here. Very important is to notice that there is space in the arch and that is diagnosis and treatment planning. Here we're talking about mechanics but the space needed in the arch is based on the diagnosis and treatment planning. We can gain space by moving teeth forward, by moving teeth out, by um, extractions, by doing interproximal reduction. So that is part of the diagnosis and treatment plan. In this uh, diagram, I'm just going to show some space. So basically, you can see that here the laterals, they want to come out as, a, as an effect. The uh, in central incisors, they, they would like to come in as an effect the canines would like to come in but because there is space they will just go back. They will go back because the wire is free to move back through the uh, premolars and to the tubes and you can see that happening time after time when you start aligning teeth and then then you align without without losing anchorage or without protruding teeth. Something very specifically that we see in a, in self ligation when we allow the wires to to move to move freely on the tubes and on the on the bra brackets. Also, when you combine that with the uprighting of the molars, as you can see here, we start with round arch wires that they don't have any torque effect on the incisors or on any tooth. However, they can tip and they can rotate the teeth without any problem. So if you start leveling and aligning, also the molars and premolars, they rotate back, they upright, and many times they uh, move the incisors also back and they upright them. Specifically, I would say in extraction cases. So um, usually in severe to moderate crowding, I use a uh, 014 centaloid I, my, uh, as my first arch wire. Then I go to an 018 centaloid and I finish this um, stage with a 20 by 20 bioforce arch wire. Then I reevaluate bracket position. If I have to change uh, any bracket for big errors, that's the right time to do it and just keep with the 20 by 20 for one appointment before going to the stage number two. So as you can see over here in mild crowding, uh, you can go with a no one a um, centaloid and then uh, go to the 20 by 20 bioforce. 
I would like to show you this case as an example of leveling and aligning. Uh, you can see here is a class one by maxillary reprotrusion. Uh, here's the cephalometric numbers and here is basically the 014 centelloid and you can see how um, that wire will go after a few months all the way back and in three months you have um, the canine all the way back uh, the incisors in a better overbite over jet, the space is reduced and that was done without any uh, elastic or any extra anchorage uh, rather than just the wire working on the case. Then after a month I have the 20 by 20 bioforce with the arches level and aligned completely. The space reduced and we are ready to go to the next step, phase, phase uh, stage 2 working stage. And of course, here is, is the finished case. Important is to notice the, um, the um, distance between the upper canine and the premolar. See how the wire is getting smaller after the alignment is, is done. So all the extra wire has to go somewhere and it usually goes back. And that's the beauty of uh, this um, of this system that as you level and align the wire uh, goes back it's easy for the wire to go back than to move teeth up or forward and therefore you have this uh, basically dental anchorage built into into the appliance now you have the finished case here that's after 1.5 uh, years post treatment and then uh, that's the x-ray uh, before and after. So stage two, work, working stage. I would like to emphasize here a couple of things. One is arch coordination. Arch coordination is very important and that refers to overjet. We have an anterior overjet and we have a posterior overjet. And you see here that arch coordination means we need to achieve a proper overjet from second molar to second molar. As you can see, the upper bracket and tubes are far more buckled than the lowers. That's about two to three millimeters and therefore we need to coordinate the wires. It's very important. Every single stainless steel arch wire has to be coordinated. You can see here two wires upper and lower taken um, out of the box. They're not coordinated. So the idea is just to coordinate them so the lower wire uh, will be under the upper two to three millimeters as you can see in this situation. So every arch wire has to be coordinated. The other very important thing is leveling the occlusal plane. Leveling the occlusal plane means that if the occlusal plane is divergent, like in this case, the end goal is to have the occlusal plane of the upper and the lower parallel one to each other like in this uh, diagram or if the occlusal planes are convergent in a in a deep bite case also they need to end that being parallel one to uh, one one against the other so that's very important and that refers to the concept that um, paralleling the uh, occlusal plane, the upper and the lower, is a treatment goal that we need to achieve in every single case, no matter how you store, the end has to be the, the same. So I will let you show a couple of cases, like this one here, when we need to coordinate the arches, it's a, it's a unilateral cross bite on an adult that it couldn't, couldn't be corrected surgically, so we camouflage, we coordinate the arches to uh, um, basically camouflage the transverse dimension and be able to uh, have the upper arch um, overlap the lower arch. And you can see an open by, so on this view you can see that the occlusal plane upper and lower are not parallel, are divergent. So you can see here that we start with a no one for centelloid and um, we coordinate the upper arch using a transpalatal bore to move the molars buckly and torque them in order to achieve a good buckle relationship and basically the leveling and aligning allow us to coordinate the arches so I'm gonna show you how we go from here to here and in about 12 to 14 months uh, we have the upper and the lower arches coordinated parallel one to each other 
um, on a 19 by 25 and at this point we can uh, use vertical elastic triangulars 316 6 ounces for the upper canine to the lower canine and to the lower premolar and then basically um, then uh, we finish the, the case you can see here the case finished with the arches um, level um, occlusal plane parallel the upper and lower and you can see over here the upper arch is coordinated um, to have an overjet of about two to three millimeters uh, over the over the lower the, the lower arch. Now it's the opposite. This is a dead by case uh, with a buckle cross by of the uh, right right side, and the idea was the same. Just make uh, just to um, parallel the upper and the lower occlusal plane and coordinate the arches. So you can see here we start with the upper arch in order to um, create an, uh, an overjet to be able to basically flatten the lower um, occlusal plane basically to level level the curve of speed. So we, we went, I'm just going to drive you from this wire to this one when we have a stainless steel in the upper and uh, we have everything level and aligned and we have um, the, uh, the uh, lower appliance just built I mean just just um, just place in we open the bite uh, with um, stops um, blue blue composite stops in the molars just to open enough so the upper teeth will not be touching the lowers and then we move the lower wire all the sequence up to a 19 by 25 stainless steel and here I have the upper arch level and the lower arch with a reverse curve of speed. I put the reverse curve of speed with my hands in the lower arch wire stainless steel and at the same time I asked the patient to wear a class 2 elastic short class 2 upper canine lower second premolar and you can see that as we do this the lower curve of speed I mean the, the curve of speed in the lower arch get flat and this is how we parallel the occlusal plane as you can see over here and then it's more parallel and then more parallel then we start closing the, the spaces and we are back to where we uh, should be um, basically with the upper and the lower occlusal planes parallel and then we finish the case you can see here the frontal view too with the arches coordinated and the occlusal plane parallel. And basically the sequence in non-extraction cases is 19 by 25 as the working arch wire and that's the arch wire that I place the reverse curve when I when I need it. I would like to mention that in extraction cases we use a 19 by 25 or 21 by 25 stainless steel uh, with, with hooks uh, and centaloid coils and depending on the anchorage requirement we use one wire or the other. I will not talk about in this webinar about management of the anchorage and we will probably do that uh, in another in another we webinar but uh, it's something very important and we have that within our our mechanics with the CCCO managing the anchorage maximum minimum or medium anchorage. Finishing stage the last one is when we fine-tune the occlusion when we made those uh, little changes just to um, have everything uh, looking the way that we like and uh, usually I use a 21 by 25 stainless steel braided wire the braided wire is a great wire uh, it's, um, it's a stainless steel um, made of uh, 8 or 7 filaments which uh, made the wires to be flexible so you can actually um, uh, change bracket positions if you have to and you still can engage the, the, the wire that little flexibility with vertical elastics allow you to basically settle the occlusion in, uh, in the buckle segments I usually um, check bracket position and, uh, and if I have to debone or rebone one bracket or two I will do it um, and this is just a picture of the braided wire that is uh, that is very uh, good at this stage. I would like to show you a case just to finish this webinar. 
um, where, uh, where we uh, fine-tune the occlusion with the braided wire so you will have an idea of what we can do. This, is, uh, as you can see, is a class, class 2 case with crowding. Uh, I treat it with extractions of the upper and the lower um, second premolars and I will, this is the first wire, and I will drive you all the way from the first wire to the last one. This is when we place the braided wire and as you can see over here there were some few problems, specifically two uh, in the area of the lower incisors. There was a black triangle because um, the uh, lower left central incisor was inclined, that was bracket position, and also in the lower second, uh, I'm sorry, the lower first premolar uh, was not sucked in. So I moved the uh, incisor to the right position, the bracket, and I moved the, uh, the lower right premolar uh, down and distal, and I, uh, and I asked the patient to, uh, to uh, wear a couple of um, uh, very short vertical triangles um, in the right and in the left, uh, and you, you can see one, how in one visit you go from here to here and the bite settles. So we were able to suck that premolar in and basically to close uh, the black triangle by aligning correctly um, the, the lower incisor. And that's, that's uh, the finished case. And basically that was the last case and I would like to uh, thank you all for uh, your kind attention and I hope that this um, short uh, overview of uh, our mechanics uh, with the CCO system uh, was uh, of uh, help. Thank you so much.